there's a real dishonesty in reporting when you report what someone is saying as the sentence or headline and then follow it up with according to so and so i mean because this is a real sneaky journalistic technique of taking a quote and turning it into a fact so this would be like me making a story about the Westboro Baptist Church with the headline, America is going to lose troops in war because we let gay marriage be legal, according to so-and-so with Westboro Baptist Church. And, you, you know, you might say, well, Adam, in and of a sentence, it's just the order, right? It's not really directly deceptive. But there are a couple of problems with this one. Headlines get shortened a lot and you leave off the attribution and now you're presenting one person's opinion as journalistic fact in your headline. And there's a lot of dishon- like if, if you keep this in mind, you'll see this. You'll see this a lot. And, and a lot of what I do in pre-digesting the mainstream media for you is, is like as I, I for those of you who are like, I don't know if you've noticed this, but the, like the really close watchers of the show who are following along with CJ. And by the way, looking forward, certainly with CJ back full time to stepping up that uh, digital video enhancement that he does as producer a lot. Uh, but already out the gate, he, he's you know figured out how to put up news stories, make them full screen and you know zoom in on the text. So you can read along with me. There are a lot of times in these mainstream media stories, I'll see a paragraph that starts with a quote has the attribution in the middle and then another quote after it. And what I'll do is I'll like, as I'm reading is my service to the audience, because when it's, when you don't see the text in quotes, you don't have the visual demarcation. And so if I were to just read the story, their part, you wouldn't be able to tell, is that a quote or not? Like, is this kind of, it's got quotation marks around it, and because of its physical placement in a paragraph, it's attributed to the reference in that paragraph. That's not as bad as the headline deception, <clears throat> but there's a lot of bullshit, <coughs> excuse me, linguistic tricks used by the mainstream media in order to uh, distort, uh, to put out a message of propaganda. And in this particular dynamic, it's often to reinforce their concept of authority. Like I said, they would never engineer a headline that says, according to the Westboro Baptist Church at the end. But according to the CDC, according to, yeah, here it is, former CDC director says. And remember that even if you get to join us here at Adam versus the man for two hours a day, five days a week, spending two hours thoughtfully ingesting news. And I hope you're ingesting even Adam versus the man thoughtfully, you know, question everything means question me too. Again, one of my favorite things about having the producers club back in me up is that I, I know I don't get corrected, but I often find that I miss something in, in trying to present a complete bigger picture. And so having people, you know, correct me on having missed something or sending me extra articles, you know, I, I, I really hugely appreciate that. So in the mainstream stories, we see this kind of deceptive headline practice as the norm. And I don't know, I'm not, I don't want to pretend to be some kind of journalism expert. I'm just a successful independent media entrepreneur. But I would like to think that when enough people realize this about how the news works, about like, again, it's a simple linguistic thing. Because in a normal conversation, if Jimbo said he was going to the store, I wouldn't say, Jim is going to the store, according to Jim. You know, what, what the fuck? I would say, hey, according to Jim, he's taking off for the store at five. Right? Because you it, you're prefacing a quote. You don't you don't you don't just put out a long quote 
And then for your reader, leave it to be like a mystery until they get to the end of the quote who actually said it. No, it's, it's not from what I think of as not just honest, but clear communication is journalism. This is where the mainstream media has sold out. And I would think that there's a, there's a deliberate practice with this. And it, it doesn't take a lot of, like, again, you know, Adam, is this con conspiracy to reword the headlines? No, but it allows, there are a few things behind it. One, just, you know, switching the phrasing around that way allows you to put the sensationalism first and the credit last. So there's kind of like a natural, shady, sensationalistic journalism element motivating this. Of course, as the mainstream media is often described as the lapdog media, the lapdog of the establishment, that would explain why they try to put something forward as fact because it was said by a government official. Like I said, you would never see a headline that says, God hates fags according to Westboro Baptist Church, right? They don't give them even the same linguistic treatment as the government. I'm not saying they should. I mean, I'm talking about Westboro Baptist Church here. But, uh, yeah, I got to use that example from the extreme to make the point, right? So back to New York City, CNBC.com. Coronavirus infection rates in the New York City area continue to soar far above other parts of the state, prompting health officials to ramp up testing, according to Governor Andrew Cuomo's office. Uh, by, by the way, you know what drives... Uh, coronavirus infection rates, corona tests. Where are corona infections low? Where they haven't got the test kits out yet. Where are they high? Where everybody's got a test kit and some of them have one third for false positive rates. I I can't say I, I predicted this. And in a way, I really did not see this coming that they were able to switch the motivation for the lockdowns and spasm of statism that we're experiencing right now from, we have to flatten the curve to save lives and make sure there are enough ventilators. Uh, don't tell people we realize ventilators weren't the best treatment most of the time. But there's a, <laughs> there's a shifting of the narrative from fatalities and overloading hospitals to and, and flatten the curve to just how many cases there are. And I mean, I did kind of call this one months ago when I realized and pointed out that this was one of the means of manipulation. But I didn't, I should have, I should have seen this coming a little earlier, that the distribution and accounting for tests being administered, positive and negative, what tests are approved and which ones are not, are going to be manipulated in order to keep the lockdowns going or to manipulate the timeline. I think I did predict this a couple months ago where I said, look, they're just going to start getting tests out that have more false positives or even not. They're just going to start getting more tests out. And even though it's in the, the part of the population that shrugs this virus off like it's nothing, they're going to be able to say, we got more cases and proportionally that we're going to have more deaths. And it's like, no, you just got testing out to a more general part of the population. And remember, I took a corona test myself. I actually got a mail, no, not a mail-in version, a mailed-to-me version, um, and was able to do it on Facebook Live. That was just what was handy, and so we did it on the bus, and you know, pricked my finger and and added some saline and, and put it on, uh, uh, put it on a strip, and turned out I was negative both for the virus and for, uh, and for antibodies. So. Um, so it looks like Lynn's going to have to reschedule Facebook issue. Um, I think because you can log StreamYard prompts you to log in with Facebook is the easiest way to do it. That's what I do. Fuck it. Facebook already knows everything about me. They as well be connected to every other service I'm having an account with on the internet. Right. So uh, apparently, uh, I'm not going to ask Lynn to go and create some other account just for this on the fly right now. Um, but she's having a bigger issue with Facebook that's preventing her from getting into uh, the stream yard right now. So we're going to say reschedule on the guest. Too bad. So it's, we're going to be teasing ahead now for Lynn Ulbricht. Uh, hopefully she will be able to join us 
at our next uh, for our next opening. By the way, I do want to say thank you to Lynn for uh, for I think we were her first interview scheduled from when she's back from from uh, some time visiting family. So I appreciate your time, Lynn. And when we get you plugged in, we're gonna have an awesome hour here. But until then. Trust me, I've got easily 45 minutes worth of headlines to get into here. All right, we do have a few notes in the producers club today. Let's see. Uh, Kim sent some photos that are, oh, here we go. Um, can you buy a gun if you hold a medical marijuana card? Uh, this was, Kim was, this looks like Kim asking Google on her phone, like Google Assistant. And the response was, since this is our first time shopping together, I'll make suggestions based on things like popularity, but my recommendations will improve as I get to know you better. Here's some options for delivery to, and then it's got our address. What sort of gun, if you hold a medical marijuana card, did you have in mind? <laughs> That's it. Now, as far as I know, um, it varies state to state, and there are a lot, of, it's kind of fucked up. There are a lot of veterans who need cannabis to manage their PTSD. I wouldn't say I need it, but I strongly benefit from it as a uh, as a mood adjuster. You know, I think uh, I'm a better guy to get along with. I'm a more functioning human being overall with some kind of regular cannabis use. Could be CBD, could be edibles, could have the same effect. I don't know. I just enjoy smoking casually and taking edibles when I need to sleep, right? Um, and there are a lot of people saying that, uh, you know, they are, I've heard from a lot of veterans say that they won't explore cannabis or derivatives for treatment for PTSD because it might put the, if they get a medical card, it puts them on a list that disqualifies them from owning a firearm. So, Kim, that's actually a good question, one that, that's relevant to me and our audience. If someone wants to find an article or a link and put that in the Producers Club today, I'd, I'd be happy to get into it. You know, what states? Um, and it looks like on the next ex excuse me, exchange with Google here, Kim was told to buy a $17 light Tommy... Excuse me, Tommy Lightseeker's weapon from toywith.com. Yeah. Excuse me, good stuff. All right. All right, so Lynn, okay, we already have Lynn scheduled for later this week, so you won't have to wait too long. And I'm, I'm actually kind of excited not just to be talking to Lynn for all those reasons I've, I've stated, but also uh, there, is a, there is an intersection with the election with her case and a major part of her effort. Uh, as, and, and mine and helping her has been uh, promoting a uh, petition drive. Um, I forget. Oh, I don't even remember now what the mechanism of this was. We will have Lynn Ulbricht, the patron saint of activist mothers, telling us herself directly later on in the week. All right. So back to New York with all these sidebars. I'm going to get through one news story today. Uh, New York is responding to growing clusters of coronavirus cases in 20 hotspot zip codes that are reporting average positivity rates or the number of tests coming back positive as high as 18 percent. Dr. Tom Frieden, the former director of the U.S. CDC under President Obama, warned on Twitter Saturday that New York City is on the edge of a precipice. Now, why am I covering this? Major story on Drudge. Major new fear mongering from government supporting lockdowns and shutdowns. And every time I, I see this, I have to. Yeah, I, 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 I'm compelled as, as part of my service to the audience here. That when the mainstream media is promoting such a bullshit narrative and the rest of your fellow Americans are going along with that understanding of the bullshit narrative, it's really important to have that counter propaganda on the tip of your tongue for your conversations around the water cooler or whatever online equivalent there is for that now. So again, two things about this story. One, flipped headline, dishonest when it ends with 
former CDC director says, you know, I don't know if this is a trend in media because I've, I've in sort of the, the, the mainstream headlines that I, I generally, this is, you know, the, the basis for the show here. I've seen a lot of them even like leaving out or shortening the attribution instead of saying, like this one says, comma, former CDC director says. So that gets cut off. All the, the rest of the headline is New York City is on the edge of a precipice as coronavirus cases grow. And you, if you see that as the headline without the attribution, if it's just cut off or left off or a short link or whatever, then you're going to assume that CNBC as a journalist organization is making the statement as a reporting, as opposed to reporting that someone else is saying it. There's so many other things in here. Like I could spend an hour just picking about the, picking apart this article, but at least when something as egregious as this comes up is like the next big talking point to justify whatever Corona shit is going on. Um, I think it's really important that at least we, the remnant as libertarians are, are confident in our counter narrative.